stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're here at the Hollywood Museum in the historic Max Factor building and waiting to be profiled are actress Jenny O'Hara and baker Alfie Weiss. She owns that company called Hot Cakes. Actress Jenny O'Hara was raised in the East Coast, attended Carnegie Tech before it was Carnegie Mellon, right. studied with Lee Strasberg, was on Broadway in 1964 with Alec Guinness, tur toured with Lottie Lenya, and you've seen her on the big screen, and she's on a regular on TV shows, and she's gotten awards for her multi-skills. <laughs> what else? You're a member of the Theater Tribe and the Matrix Theater, mm -hmm. and you're married and to an actor. And Ensemble Studio Theater. Oh, ensemble Theater. Oh, ensemble Studio Theater. Right. And you're married to Nick Ola. I am. An actor. I, he is. <laughs> and was there show business besides him and your family? Oh, my mother. Yeah, my mother was always interested in the theater. She was an apprentice when she was a girl in summer stock and uh, oh she, she was yeah she was on the stage no oh no no, no. <laughs> she was Everson. building scenery <laughs> oh she <laughs> was like that yeah the oh. apprentices do all the scout work did you go and see any of that when she was doing it no because i wasn't born yet <laughs> oh it was way before way you. way before but then i did my own apprenticeships in uh, summer stock later you know, when i was 14 and 15. well how did you get to Carnegie Tech? Cause was that an acting studio school? Oh, yeah. It, oh, it's it a was. very famous acting uh, university. Because I know Carnegie Mellon is very into arts. Right. The arts are great. Right. right. But you had acting. At the, are, do they yeah, still have yeah. acting? Oh, yeah. They do an amazing um, theater and musical theater program. Was there any kind of turnabout for you there? Did something happen there? That yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Was it? Kind of. My mother made me audition. I had a secret scholarship to a college in the Midwest. I had forged their signatures because I was going to be a nurse. Nobody was going to tell me what I was going to do. Uh -huh. And she made me audition. And I said, oh, God, Mom, I'll never get in. And it's very expensive. And I'd have to get a scholarship. And she said, come on, just do it. So I did and got a scholarship and got in and was asked to leave. <laughs> oh. Is that the turning point? Yeah. Why, the, why were you asked to leave? I was having too much fun. Oh. I joined a sorority and I was going to fraternity parties. In Pittsburgh? Parties. Yes. You can have that kind of fun they in do, Pittsburgh. They do, they <laughs> do, and painting the SAE lions and, you know, and all that stuff. And I wasn't taking it very seriously because it made no sense to me uh, what they were talking about. Well, Pittsburgh's not too far from New York. Then did you go to New York? I did, I did. After that, they, they said, come back. In, in a year or so, come back when you, you're too young. <laughs> when you grow up. <laughs> well, I was 17, yeah. so I was too young, and it was my first time away from home, so it was like, ah! <laughs> Somebody let me out of the box. Um, and my dad wanted me to come back home to Warren, Pennsylvania, and be a secretary at Sylvania for a year. Oh, I can see you doing that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I would have been <laughs> deeply invested in that. But I had already, I went off to do summer stock and was an apprentice for no pay. But they gave me um, a part. Oh, that's how that happened? Yeah, they gave me a part. And it was the first time I'd ever had to work really hard for the privilege of being on a stage. But it was a privilege to you. It you was, knew that. It became a privilege and not a given or not just yeah. something. So was that the beginning of your career, yeah. really? Yeah, uh, then I went off to New York. And, th and then how did you get on Broadway, or how did you get with Alec Guinness? Uh, well, I, I auditioned. Uh, I, first I went out with, you know, I, I studied with Lee Strasberg. Oh, right, you were studying with right. Lee. So and he had connections, too. Did he help his no, students? No, it was nothing no? like that. You just, you did the work, and I was observing at the actor's studio, and I was, beca I, I, I sought that out on purpose, because I had an instinct about it, I read about it, and I thought, I understand this 
sort of approach to acting, but I didn't understand what was going on at Carnegie at that time. Oh, because he made you a part of what was going on, too, instead of just talking to you. Yeah, well, it was all about emotional work, and That's it was all name, about yeah. your own, you know, your own body using yourself in not beats and not bits. It wasn't mechanical or mathematical, and so it made sense to me, and then, you know, I auditioned for stuff, and I got... Uh, I, I I got uh, Brecht on Brecht with Lenya. She, that was fantastic. Where did you go incredible. with that? She did a four-month tour, the only, because uh, she had been in it in the Off-Broadway run, the only tour that she would do, the only anything that she would do was those four months to universities. And how old was she? Was she old then? Oh, yeah. And yeah. was she really sharp? Oh, sharp as a tack. And I, I, I had a great part myself and did wonderful material. But I also had to cover all of her songs. Oh, in case she did In didn't. case her voice oh. went. So I learned them in English and in German. What would happen? And she would taught you, them to me. Would you be in the back if something happened with her voice, or would you have to come on stage and sit with her and sing, or what would no, happen? I would just step on. Just I step would just on? step in. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. She might know before the show that her voice was... was or if uh, she was singing in German, you just step on and finish it? Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. What kind you do of, what you do. Wow. But what kind of training did that? Spontaneity. <laughs> I mean, that really is a training ground, isn't it? Yeah, it was. And I left it early because uh, I had auditioned before we went into rehearsal for um, for Dylan, but they hired somebody else who was terrible, <laughs> and I heard they were looking for me. And I rem and my agent said, oh, you know, no, don't bother. You know, it's agent. You're in a show. It's a right. stretch. And I thought, well, and I talked to Lenya, and she said, Go, go. Oh, how when, are you, when are you ever going to get to work with Alec Guinness again? It may never happen again. Go. So I remember the name of one of the producers, and his phone number was in the book. <laughs> so it was about 11.30 at night after the show, and I called him up, and I said, Hi, this is Jenny O'Hara. And he said, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, so it's said, 11.30. <laughs> yeah, and I said, I hear you're looking for me. And he said, Well, yes, yes, we are. And How I said, great. well, are, are you making a firm offer, or are you still just fooling around? <laughs> Did you? You were pretty yes, gutsy, so, weren't know, you? Said, well, well, you had a job anyway. <laughs> I, I didn't know any better. Yeah. And he said that he had been authorized by Peter Glenville, the director, to hire me if they could get me. So I talked to Lenya, and the next day I was on a plane to New York, and we managed to get me out of my contract with Brecht, replace me in Brecht, because my agent had a client who just finished the show who had done Brecht on Brecht. How great. And So it just all worked out. It was meant to be. It was meant to it be. Meant and to the be. Brechtian connection was so interesting to me because, you know, I'm in a little Pennsylvania high school, and the poetry of E.E. E. Cummings and Bertolt Brecht really resonated with me. How I found that poetry? I have no idea. Because I was going to say, you wouldn't know it from Carnegie either, would no, you? No, no, but I knew it. I knew it, and I loved it. So, and I heard it was being done in New York, and I thought, oh, I'll never, ever get to be part Isn't of it. Isn't that fabulous? But, but that's a great beginning for a career that's taken you all these years. Yeah. To yeah. What, one of the things, but you've taught, you were talking about Strasbourg yeah. and how to teach. Did you teach that method? Did you teach? Well, I'm teaching now. You're still teaching. I'm te I never did before, but I, I'm teaching now at Risa Brayman's studio at Raymond uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Raymond Garcia Braun, ah. which is a wonderful studio. And do you teach that technique? Yeah, oh, I yeah. teach all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Well, shortcuts. Uh, kind of so you came back to L.A. Came back. From I came New out York. to L.A. from New you York. You came out to L.A. and. What did you start doing? I just started working here. Lots of TV. Lots of TV. Um, and, and I've gone back to do plays on Broadway. Oh, have you in, in between? Broadway. Yeah, yeah. Still go back regularly. Well, the last time I saw you on stage, and it, I don't know how long ago, it was Broadway Mist. I mean, Bakersfield, Bakersfield Mist. Mist right. Broadway Mist. Yeah, That's a good one, right? Yeah, that's that very good. Bakersfield Mist, right. which was fantastic because you and and Nick, Nick yeah. Allett were in it together. Yeah. And what, what was that story? Uh, it was the story about the Pollock painting. The woman who bought a painting as a joke for a friend, she, and she, it was based on a true story. She lives in Bakersfield. And uh, I think for three bucks in a thrift shop. 
Yeah, I think she did something like that. And it, it was too big to fit in her friend's house, so they got drunk and threw it out in the street. And then she thought, ah, I maybe you know get my three bucks back. So she put it in a garage sale that she oh, was having. Oh, that's what happened. And right. one of the, and the uh, local art teacher came by and said, you know, I might be crazy, but I think that's a Jackson Pollock. And that started her quest. And then did they write that for you? Was it written for you? Yes. Stephen wrote it with me and Nick in mind. He had started to write the book. Who's Stephen? Stephen Sachs. Oh, Stephen Sachs who's wrote the, it. Who's right, the artistic at the director at the Fountain and who also wrote the play right. and directed it. Uh -huh. And he said he kept hearing our voices in his head when he was writing it, so he was going to write it for us. And we said, that's nice. Because I didn't realize that Stephen was a playwright. So now you have a one-woman play. Yeah. Was it written for you? No. Broomstick. Broomstick. Tell us about that. Well, I play a really old... <laughs> witch. That's all I thought of was Poss a witch. Possibly. Maybe yes. Maybe no. Oh, but I thought She's broomstick. She's an old Appalachian woman, and she lives in a hut in the forest, mm. and somebody comes to visit. And who wrote it? A guy named John Bigonet wrote it. And I just happened upon it, and, I, and Stephen was told that I was interested in doing it. And he called me and he said, I hear you're interested in Broomstick. And I said, well, I haven't read it, but why? And he said, are you interested? And he said, I don't know, I'll read it. And so we both read it, and we thought, I'll, I said, I'll do it if you direct it. So, so that was back to Stephen Sachs again? Back to Stephen Sachs again. And we're again. At, at, at the, the fountain. fountain. Right. I see, okay. So he's directing it. Yeah, it, it's an amazing play because on the surface of it, you think she's a creepy old witch. And she, oh, oh, that's just what I thought, yeah. just because of what you read. Yeah, right? yeah, and she tells stories about herself, and and so, you know, it's creepy and creepy. But once you start getting into it, she it, it's such a rich character. What about the costuming? I haven't done it yet. You do the costuming. What yeah. about the lighting? You bring people oh, in to it, do Oh, God, yeah. Oh, there's, an ama there's a guy from Disney who's done the set. That's amazing, and a lighting designer that he works with a lot. But there are points where the walls will be transparent, oh. and you can see the forest moving outside. Oh, so it's not just like a reading. No, it's, like it's not just very like a reading. Strong. It's really a very strongly produced play. And what kind of voice do you use? Just do you use like that? that? Yeah. How is it's it? Real dark. Well, it's dark. You know, it's like chewing a brick. All the R's are really hard. Are you going to wear a wig? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What kind of <laughs> wig? Gonna, I don't know. I'm going to be fitted for <laughs> wigs and clothes tomorrow. Oh. But it's going to be. She talks about herself that she wears these dark things and these capes and hoods and things, and people think she's all creepy. Oh, and that's great. There's a love story in the middle of it. And you're there when alone. When her heart was broken, it is so... She becomes 15. Oh, that's Again, So then you have eyes. to transform, too, oh, right? All the time, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. All right, before we go, the character that you were on TV in King of Queens is totally different from her, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. What was she doing? She was the mother, Doug's mother. <laughs> I am so popular with New York City cops. I cannot tell you. <laughs> if I am ever near a cop shop and there are guys standing out there, they say, hey, hey, Doug's mother. There's my <laughs> Doug's mother? <laughs> Doug's mother, right. They watch the show. They watch. It's it's been in syndication forever. People watch it. I was shooting an episode of Mike and Molly last night, and the audience, you know, gets autographs and things after you're done. <laughs> and people were asking me to sign because they remembered me in King of Queens. Oh, they loved you that. Um, well, I didn't want to let that go without talking about so from popular. your witchy broomstick to your to this lovely mother. <laughs> oh, I'm so oh, I'm so glad you came today. Uh, you have to come and see it. Come I will. And see it. Thank you, Jenny O'Hara. You're welcome. And don't go away. We'll be right back with our <laughs> Baker entrepreneur, Alfie Weiss. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We are taping at the Hollywood Museum on Highland Avenue, and our guest is Alfie Weiss, who was born and raised in France, where she was a child model, she was on TV, in films, and on the stage. And by the age of 10, she had a singing career. Alfie recorded the theme song for the cartoon version of Tom Sawyer, then went on to co-host in France for Channel 2. She then signed with EMI when she was a teenager and came to Los Angeles. 
You were 18 years old. Yes, I was. And how long did you spend with uh, EMI? I was signed for five years. I had a five-year contract, three album, <laughs> one, one of those great record deals that you used to get in the 90s, you know. And what kind of voice? What kind of music? <clears throat> I used to write my own song. It was pop, pop music, you know, and I sang in English. And, you know, I started singing when I was seven years old in France. So I've, I had done already a lot of records. How did you get to start singing? Was there music in your family? What was it? Well, my, my, my mom and dad were in entertainment. My, oh, they were? My father was one of the creators of the big transvestite cabarets in Paris, the Alcazar and the Paradis Latin. Oh. And my mother worked at the Moulin Rouge for years. You're kidding. You so know. were you there at all I was those there. shows? I was, I was almost born backstage. You know, That's at fantastic. The yeah. And those are also well known. Very well, very well known. Yeah, it's where Bob Fosse and Liza Minnelli uh, got inspired inspired to do the film Cabaret, the Alcazar, in 1969. That's where I was born. Isn't that fantastic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and, what, whole, and, and what kind of actors came in? They were all... Everybody came in. Everybody came everybody in? Everybody came in. When I was in the womb of my mother, um, they did the, the uh, Happy Birthday of Louis Armstrong. Oh, I mean, did they? they? Did, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so everybody was there. So, so did you get to sing there? I sang at the Alcazar yeah, when I was 16 years old. Yeah, I did a show there. And then in other places in, in I, France? I mean, yeah, I sang at the Olympia in France, at the Zenith. Um, I did a lot of TV also. And, um, you know, I sang that song from Tom Sawyer, but I had done other albums as, as well. So then I toured and, and all that. When you co when you co-hosted the TV show, mm -hmm. and what, what kind of show was that? It was a children's show. It was a live show. So it was live TV, and children in France don't have school on Wednesday afternoon, so it was a live three-hour show You're kidding. every day. And did you have a live audience, too? It, there was no live audience. It was just live TV. It was live TV. Yeah, yeah. So wh when you came to Los Angeles uh -huh. to record and mm -hmm. to sing and to do your albums, mm -hmm. did you start taking acting lessons, too? Uh, I was taking acting, acting lessons in France. I never took acting lessons in L.A. I took singing oh. lessons in L.A. Oh, you did? Yeah. They, did they send you to someone? No. <coughs> uh, I had found somebody, somebody uh, Robert Edwards, his name was, and fantastic singing coach that I loved. And so I used to take lessons from him. Was your um, voice changing because you were young? No, I think that's more for boys than it is for girls. I that mean, the voice has changed? Range, your range um, improves a little bit when you become older and lowers, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, but, you know. Did you, you, you took ballet and yes. music at the conservatoire yes, in I Paris. Did, did you did. continue ballet here too? No, I stopped ballet. I mean, I danced for 10 years, three hours every morning straight. <laughs> did you? <laughs> So that was so it. You, I'm <laughs> laying this background because it's amazing. It's very uh, rich and um, uh, filled. You know, the first chapter of, I always refer life as chapters, and the first chapter of my life was very, very rich and very um, busy. And know? also very cultured. Extremely. Yeah. Yeah, because I was always, a, I was a, an only child. I was always around mm -hmm. adults, and I was always around adults in entertainment. So, so how different was L.A. from what you were doing in Paris when you came here? Was it like culture shock? No. I mean, I had been in L.A. a few times before. Uh, the main thing is that, you know, in France, I was very famous. I was very known. I couldn't walk down the street. <laughs> in L.A., I was anonymous, you know, <laughs> which is a good thing because, you, you But know. it's hard, too, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of weird, you know. You're not used to it. It's like, oh, well. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you did a film with Roger Vadim. Yes, I did a film with Roger Vadim. I did many TV shows with Nina Companez, who's a fantastic director as well. I mean, I did a lot of theater. Um, and you did a lot of voiceover. A lot of voiceover in L.A. Uh, in L.A. because yes. of this French accent, yes. I bet, yeah. right? Yeah. That, and, and did that take precedence in your life it for did. a long I time? It did. I mean, actually, it actually paid my bills for a long time. Throughout my 20s, you know, I did a ton of voiceovers, you know. That was a, a great way of making money. It was fantastic. And it was fun. It, uh, and it <laughs> kind of combines both. You know, you're like, a, you're, I was used to be in a recording studio, and I used to be having headphones and watching. So it was like... Both of them. You're oh, you acting did them both. Right, right, You're right, in the right, recording right. studio. It's kind of interesting. So we have stage, TV, mm -hmm. singing, and now we have baking. Right? This is another chapter. Yes. How did this happen? Well, uh, <laughs> when my father 
before he was in entertainment, was a baker. Oh my gosh. And he, in order to be able to pay for his dancing lessons, he would bring cakes to his dancing teachers. And that's how he would be allowed to take the dancing lesson. Oh, so he was, was trading was his trading. services. And so um, at, uh, in my early 30s, I told my dad, I'm kind of tired of you know, entertainment and it's, it's hard and I want to I have stability. It's and hard want, <laughs> compared to baking. <laughs> I want to have stability. I want to have tangibility. You know? And um, I said, I'm going to open a bake store. And, you know, at the time in L.A. there was not that many baked stores. It was Sweet Lady Jane's, and that's about it. Where, you know? would you, where did you think you would open? I opened right next to where I live in Venice. You know, I live in Venice at the edge of Venice and Culver City, and I opened right there on Sentinella in Washington Boulevard, and there was a little baked store that a guy had put together, and he wasn't successful, and then I just bought it. So it was really a bakery? It was already a bakery. With an oven? And yeah. It had everything in it. It had everything you needed? So then I bought it, and I went to <laughs> Paris for a month and a half. I did an internship in a fantastic bakery in Paris, and then I just opened the doors and started doing it. And there you were. And that's it. And then you were the winner of the Cupcake Wars. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then interestingly enough, it's like entertainment comes back. I know, you know? That's what I, mean. <laughs> I have these producers calling, we want to film a show. I was like, oh, yeah, right. Well, that's why you've been on CNN and VH1 mm -hmm. and um, what else? ABC, NBC, CW, yeah. The Fox. But you know how to do that all. I do. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> I mean, but you also know how to bake, right? Yeah. It's the best of both worlds. You I know? know. It's fantastic. I so, mean, baking gives you baking the, the the great thing about baking versus entertainment is that baking gives you instant gratification exactly. people come in your store they eat a cupcake they eat something they'll go wow it's great or, or they go wow it's disgusting but most of the time they say wow <laughs> it's so great how, how did you come on the name and then hot cakes well that's my ex-husband who used to say well you're a hot cake so your hot cakes bakes you're a hot cake <laughs> <laughs> Hot star. Yeah, oh, so, so you star. were hot cakes. Yeah. And did they expect to come and get pancakes from hot cakes? A lot, of people, a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people think that. But, but you no. do cook, you do bake breakfast we things. We do. We do morning pastry. We do croissants. We do, uh, we do all of the pastries by hand. It's all artisan baking. And where did this inspiration come from to be a success? I mean, you're totally inspired. <laughs> Survival. And you're totally... Survival. Uh, uh, yeah. Single mama, having a little boy, having to feed him. You have to be successful. But you had a career. Yes, but you know what? Not everything lasts forever, and not everything is forever in life, you know. And I was at a time where, you know, I had had that career since I was seven years old. I was in my early 30s, um, in the middle of a divorce. I had a little child, and I had to do something. I didn't get to go to college. I didn't do all these That's things. That's the thing. I worked since I was a child. Right. You didn't have any education, have, that kind of education, no, formal education. I didn't have anything to fall back on. And my mom said to me something very wise. She says, well, you have only have two choices right now. You can either feed people or you can either do something with their babies. People will always need two things. They will always eat and they will always make babies. So figure it out. So, so you figured it and out. And I figured it out. But I your father them. figured it out too, mm -hmm. a way of survival for him. He did, yeah. Did you think about that at the time? No, I didn't at the time. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it, it was... It's, it's it natural. Was, it was natural, you know, and I always knew how to bake. I've always baked for people. It was a way of making money when I didn't have money in the times of entertainment when it's not giving you a part or you don't have a gig and, you know, you have to do something. Well, I could cook for people. I could bake for people. So, so, when, so when you won the Cupcakes War, mm -hmm. were pe was it the beginning of when people were saying, oh, cupcakes are in now? It was. When I opened Hot Cakes, I opened I'm gonna show um, this. six months after Sprinkle. So it was right the beginning. Oh. It was the beginning of the trend, so, so, which I don't think is going to be a trend anyway, because I really believe that cupcakes is the icon of American pastries. We've always had cupcakes. Exactly. It but was sprinkles, just a matter of reviving it. And they brought it into the forefront. Yeah. This is a beautiful dozen, yeah. right? We yeah. have a dozen. Tell we have a us, dozen. Like, tell us from... So you have the chocolate chocolate right here, and you've got the chocolate raspberry mousse and the lemon and the red velvet. Oh, we'll go this way. Yeah. Okay. And then I put another chocolate because I like chocolate. Okay. And then strawberry sprinkle, key lime, chocolate mint, Chocolate cream cheese, espresso, and coconut. And do you make regular size too? Yeah, 
we make regular size too. And yeah. tell us a little bit. I'm going to hold this croissant so for these Gary are to see. French croissant, and they're made with good French butter, and we make it every day. Well, that was the thing with croissants. When people first started making croissants in LA, somebody said, "Oh, they don't taste like France no. because of the water." No, people think it's the water. People, it's not. It's it's not the water. It's not the flour. Oh, it's um, not. It's not the butter. It's well, it's a combination of everything. You know, <laughs> flour in America has a lot more gluten than the flour in in France, so that makes things much tough, much tougher. Tougher. You know, where French flour is a lot less strong, you know. But it's also the the the, the knowledge of how to do it. And and you learned that in six months when you were I an learned apprentice. That, yeah, that was one of the things I learned in one month. I Is that right? Mm -hmm. But I already knew how to do it. You know, was it a secret? Knew. Is it like a secret to make a great no, croissant? No, it's, it's not a secret. It's just a it's just a savoir faire, you know. And it's just you have, you it, have it in your hands. Have it. You, you have, have it to know the hands. dough. You have to know how, it, you know, laminate it. How it's going to make layers. But you know? do you get up in the morning and do this? Not anymore. But you did, <laughs> I right? Did. And and what would you suggest to someone who wanted to? Well, let, before we say, what would you suggest? Tell us what this is. This is a financier. Financier oh. are little cakes that are made with almond flour. This is a blueberry financier. Um, and this is uh, lemon curd um, with um, a meringue top. This is a dessert. Mm -hmm. This is a breakfast. This is a, yeah, this is a breakfast. This is good for coffee. This is obviously a breakfast, you know. That's your breakfast. And we make all the arrays of croissant, you know. You make it. But, but do everything. they make the, those arrays in France? Yeah. Oh, all oh, those yeah. different kinds? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I thought it was always something that the Americans decided no, 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 they no, wanted no. to oh, no, do. No, no, no. Pain au chocolat is the, Ameri is the icon. Pain au chocolat. French. <laughs> Pain au chocolat is the French thing, you know, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, before we go, yeah. just tell us one more thing. Give us some advice on how to start a business like this. How would you start a business? You just have to invest in yourself. Uh, have absolutely no fear whatsoever. You have to be fearless if you want to be successful in business. And the best advice I could give you is get into something that you have no knowledge about. Really? Because if you have no knowledge about, you have no expectations, you don't know, you just go for it. I didn't know really anything about how to run a bakery. If I would have known, I would have never done it because it's so much work. It's so hard. But because I didn't know, I went into it very candidly it, with a certain naivete that gives you that um, edge to success, I think, because you have no other choice. You know? and, and also, in keeping with that, you do service a lot of celebrities. I you do. have a big celebrity clientele. How did I that do. come about? Can you name just, them? I, it came about just by, I did a lot of charity. Uh -huh. uh, so eventually people come. I, do, I work a lot with the studios. You know, I work with Ron Howard. I worked with Schwarzenegger. I worked with... You know, Ann H. and you know Alfred Woodward, and just many, many, many people. Just cakes, taking food, cake, cakes, cakes th making cakes for them. I like see. Delivering caps cakes. You know, just many, many people. And I think word to mouth, I gave a lot. You know, to, to get lot. back. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The more you give, the more you get. And thank you for doing thank that. You. We can't wait to eat these. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. And thanks for watching. Keep writing to J A Q U I N N one at AOL.com.